hope you can hear me. If, I'm good at talking loud, so I'll just talk loud. Um, wow, what a crowd. I think we just set a record for our most attended event in this space with everybody standing around. And just in honor of Henry and Tom Block, we really appreciate you coming. My name is Jeff Hornsby, and I am the Henry Block Endowed Chair for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, the Director of the Rainier Institute, and the Chair of the Department of Global Entrepreneurship and Innovation here at UMKC. And it's my privilege to kick off this academic year, academic year version of First Wednesdays. And before we get to our, uh, our speakers, I do want to acknowledge our other distinguished guests. We have our Chancellor, Leo Morton, who will be uh, speaking in just a minute. We have our Dean, David Donnelly. We have uh, our members of our Rainier Institute Advisory Council that are here. We thank you for coming. We have members of the Rainier Institute, faculty and staff, uh, and the De and Department of Global Entrepreneurship. We have Block School faculty and staff. We thank you for coming and supporting our event as well. And we want to thank our mentors, who are many that are here today. The mentors are a foundation of our eScholar program and our academic programs, providing countless hours of advising and mentoring and shepherding our student ventures and our eScholar ventures to launch. And we really appreciate all their support and their help uh, in our programs. It's my pleasure to turn the mic over to our Master of Ceremonies. Uh, ben Williams. Ben is the Assistant Director of the Rainier Institute for Student Programs. He also advises our Enactus group, a highly successful cross-campus student group. And so, Ben, I turn it over to you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Hornsby. Thank you all for being here today. Um, I think Dr. Hornsby is correct in saying that this is probably the largest crowd that's ever been in this room. Um, so nobody called the fire marshal, uh, could be an issue. Um, I, sorry, I left my clicker over here. All right, can everyone hear me all right? Good. Um, so first of all, this is our first, first Wednesday of the semester. Um, we will have one on the first Wednesday of every month for the entire semester. Um, the next two, we have a, a Young Entrepreneurs panel on October 5th, moderated by Zach Pettit, who graduated in uh, 2015. Um, and November 2nd, we've got Barnett Hellsberg of Hellsberg Diamonds joining us. And then uh, for the December 1st Wednesday, we'll have the finals of our Rue Idea Jump competition. So please do join us for that. Um, and I'm going to do a few quick announcements now that I've got a ton of people in the room. Um, as Dr. Hornsby mentioned, I am the faculty advisor for the Enactus team. Uh, Enactus uses entrepreneurship to solve social problems in the community. So if you're interested in taking action and having an impact on your community, please join us. Uh, we have meetings Tuesday nights at 5.30, upstairs in 331, or check out our website, which is umkcenactus.org. Um, next, we've got our hatchery. Those of you that have not checked out our hatchery upstairs, um, it's in room 332. This is where we support student ventures and help them uh, take wings and fly, if you will. Um, we uh, don't just take fully formed venture teams. We take people with ideas, people that want to join a team, or maybe uh, outside companies that want some support on an idea they want to pursue. Right now, we're looking for those of you that uh, want to join a student startup but do not have your own idea. So maybe you just want to uh, join on a, an already existing team. Um, we're looking for a variety of skill sets. So if you're interested in getting involved in a, a student venture, um, please do uh, get on the website. Um, all these programs can be found on our uh, Rainier Institute website. Uh, E-Scholars, our signature program here at the Rainier Institute. Um, this is an early stage program to support, or a, a program to support early stage ventures. So we're the premier early stage uh, accelerator in Kansas City. We're just about to start our new cohorts uh, this Saturday. So we're now taking applications for our next cohort that starts in January. So if you're interested in taking part in that, getting involved, um, getting support on your own venture, if you're a student, you can take that for credit, um, but uh, it's open to community members as well. You don't have to take it as a student, uh, but that is available to you if you wish. 
Um, also, Tech Week. So Tech Week is a huge conference happening here in Kansas City next week. Uh, we have received some free student codes to participate. Um, if you uh, use these access codes up here, you have to have a, a .edu email address, so sorry those that are joining us from outside the school. Uh, if you have a .edu uh, email address, you can use that to log on the website here and get free passes. So you need a pass to get into uh, all the events happening for the week. You can find the schedule online. Uh, but do check that out. Um, as part of Tech Week, um, the Launch KC program is bringing in the finalists for the Launch KC grants, and we'll be picking or well, announcing the winner um, of those grants or the winners. Um, we are lucky enough to have one of the finalists here with us today. Uh, Max Younger is the, uh, one of the founders of uh, Mobility Designed. Um, we had uh, Max and his wife Liliana here last year um, to show us a brand new marketing video that they had put together. Uh, soon after that, the video went viral and got seen by, what was it, millions of people per minute for however long that was. So tens of millions of views, maybe hundreds? Something like that. All right. So. Bunch of people saw this, went viral, got picked up. It was in, um, uh, on all sorts of websites all over uh, international news. So, uh, fantastic story. Um, and I'd like to bring uh, Max up here just to give us an update since he was here last year. Uh, Mobility Designed is uh, part of our, they went through our eScholars program. Max is a graduate of our eScholars uh, program. And they've just been doing fantastically well ever since. So, um, with that, Max, if you'd like to come on up. Thanks. Okay. All right. Cool. So this is forwarded now. Yeah. Awesome. Can you hear me? Everybody good? Hey. Um, thank you guys for having me tonight. Uh, I'm Max Younger, as you guys just heard several times, I think. Um, yeah, so I'm one of the founders of Mobility Designed, and we make uh, this crutch. And so this, is, uh, this has been a long time in the works. We were an eScholars, uh, well, an eScholars alumni now, I guess. And uh, we were here last year, as you just said, which it's crazy to feel like it's been a year since I was standing here. Um, feels like 10. And um, we, uh, we've been doing a lot of work since. We've been developing an amazing team of people and uh, kind of making this thing come to market. So um, as Ben said, we had our video. You guys kind of saw it last year. We're not going to re-show that this time. I imagine, I guess, how many of you actually have seen our video? If you could raise your hand. Um, cool. So a decent number of you. And that's, that's great. A lot of people around the world have seen it. It's something like um, uh, close to 280 million impressions now. Um, just the video itself has been seen somewhere just south of 40, well, around 45 million uh, views, which is pretty crazy. Um, so with that, we kind of, we weren't on sale before it went viral. And when it went viral, we had to, um, we had to put it on sale. <laughs> so that, that uh, changed kind of our trajectory massively. And uh, when, when something like that happens, we just noticed a lot of traffic kind of hitting our website, right? And, um, and then all of a sudden, you know, we're, a friend of mine called me and said, that video that I posted on my Facebook, it's like, you know, a few million views. And I'm like, that's crazy, that's insane. Um, and then I don't know about a million a minute, that would have been amazing, but uh, it was about a million an hour there for a little while. So um, yeah, that was, a really crazy weekend, and we had to rebuild the website to try to capture some of that traffic. We call it kind of capturing lightning in a bottle. Um, and since then, we've been building an even bigger team uh, because the team is super, super important to us. We have only a limited uh, number of skills between our founders, and so we have to keep expanding um, as we need more skills on the team. Um, and those kinds of uh, things allow us to figure out uh, how to actually make this business into a business, not just a product. Um, so, yeah, with that, we had um, a lot of things happen. Like, a lot of people reached out wanting to be on a waiting list, just emailing us, and uh, we had to figure out how to make the website uh, route traffic to different channels and capture all of it, um, and then figure out how to sell it because of the Food and Drug Administration, FDA. Uh, you guys have heard of that. Um, so there's issues with selling medical products without, you know, being compliant with the FDA and selling products in Europe and how do you limit, you know, sales to Europe and the rest of the world that are trying to buy them. 
So all that stuff we were trying to figure out, and we luckily had a really good team of people to help us make it happen. Um, yeah, so the first run that we had, are, they're sold out, and, um, which, was, which was great. And now the, the second run is, is uh, quickly filling up, and so we'll, we're kind of full for this year, basically. And uh, we're trying to catch up on the back end now. So it's not just like building the front end and getting the word out. Now that's kind of happened. A lot of people you know, said hello when they saw this video. And um, they write you, you know, long, long emails, two, three page emails of, of why they need these things, why they've always needed these things and they wish that they had had them, which um, you know, is, is really, I guess, motivating for us to read those and kind of go through those at night and, and uh, learn what these needs of these people are. So yeah, we, um, we now are trying to, to build the back end to work with uh, the amount of demand on the front end. So we have the first production parts that are coming in now. Some of them are over there on the table. Um, you guys are feel free to take a look uh, a little bit later if you're interested. We'll be around. And uh, yeah, oh, by the way, we're going to be in the, uh, yeah, you guys heard the uh, launch KC thing on next Friday. So if you guys are around, just come support us. Uh, we'll be at Union Station presenting. So thank you. All right, Max, thanks so much. Um, mobility design is a, a, a great success story that's come through our e-scholars and exactly the type of venture that we want to support when they're solving um, real needs, real problems in the world. Um, so thanks again, Max. Um, finally, at this point, I would like to invite Chancellor Morton up here um, to introduce our guest today. Well, thank you. Wow, this is a great crowd. Well, thank you for inviting me here today. I, good afternoon, everyone. You know, I, I really think this is an excellent way to kick off a new school year. You know, this is a great way to welcome our students to a new semester and show them how glad we are that they're here. And I certainly hope that they're looking forward to an exciting fall at the Block School. So now, uh, we also want to thank our alumni and special guests joining us today as we gather to learn from and, and be inspired by uh, two great UMKC supporters sitting right here. Now, uh, you're in for a treat um, because we have the privilege of hearing from Block School benefactor and Entrepreneur Hall of Fame inaugural inductee, Mr. Henry Block and chairman of the uh, Block School Endowment Fund, UMKC trustee and member of the UMKC Foundation Board of Directors, Henry's son, Tom Block, all right? Now, we're also very proud that, uh, of our Entrepreneurs Hall of Fame here at UMKC's Henry W. Block School of Management. And I'd like to acknowledge one, I was gonna acknowledge two, but one of our very special guests here today, Joe Rately, uh, he's a benefactor. He and his wife, uh, Judy, uh, are the ones who made this wonderful Hall of Fame possible. So, Joe, would you wave to everybody here? Thank you. <laughs> Joe is a special entrepreneur as well. He's invented more stuff than you can... Well, anyway, I won't get started. <laughs> Thanks for being here, Joe. So you see, the vision of the uh, Hall of Fame was to, uh, to be a place where we could honor bold ideas and inspire bright futures. You know, a place that would inspire events like this one, where students and alumni and community members could come together to honor Kansas City's top entrepreneurs. Now, the Hall of Fame has become a reality, and if you haven't had a chance to tour the hall, be sure to check it out during the reception this evening. Now, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce our guest of honor. Now, I'll start with Tom Block, who 40 years ago, in 1976, joined H&R Block, the world's largest tax preparation service. There, he spearheaded the automation of the company's retail network and also the company's practice for filing returns electronically, going on today. Tom was elected president of tax operations in 1981, promoted to president of the company in 1989, and succeeded his father, Henry Block, as CEO in 1992. Now, 
Tom's second career began in 1995 as a middle school math teacher at St. Francis Xavier in inner city parochial school. Uh, and five years later, he co-founded the University Academy, a public charter school in Kansas City. Now, for several years, Tom taught seventh and eighth grade math at the Urban College Prep School he helped to design and launch. He was also president of the school's board from 2000 to 2010. Now, the academy has grown from 200 students in grades seven through nine in its first year to 1,000 in kindergarten through grade 12. The school moved into its $40 million facility in 2005 and its high school has been recognized as one of America's best in both US News and World Report and Newsweek. Now, if you're wondering about Tom's career change, wonder no more. You can read all about it in Tom's first book called Stand for the Best. I recommend it to you. It's a memoir about his journey from CEO to inner city teacher and school founder. In the book, he shows what can be accomplished when teachers, students, and community all stand for the best. Now, in his second book, Many Happy Returns, that's a biography about his father, Henry Block, who co-founded H&R Block and was a pioneer of the commercial tax preparation industry, all right? In that book, you will see that it was Henry Block's steadfast commitment to never giving up, never taking shortcuts, and always putting the customer first that helped H&R Block soar to global success. Henry and his brother Leon began a bookkeeping service in 1946, a year after I was born. And, and, uh, and, but he started with a, uh, with a small loan from his aunt, all right? Now you'll see that uh, they started by catering to small businesses in downtown Kansas City. Now, the business struggled in the first year and Leon left, but Henry persisted alone until another brother, Richard, joined him and became a partner. Henry and Richard Block worked hard to grow their business over the coming years and in the decades that followed, H&R Block expanded to, expanded to other markets, became a global company, went public, and prepared more than 650 million tax returns. Beginning in the early 1970s, Henry Block appeared in national television commercials as the company's spokesman, quickly earning recognition as a corporate icon and America's tax man, right? Henry is widely known and respected as a businessman, civic leader, and philanthropist who is still working to improve the quality of life in Kansas City. Thank you. After his retirement from H&R Block, Mr. Block has worked daily on his philanthropic endeavors in Kansas City, including this school, the Henry W. Block School of Management here at UMKC, the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, St. Luke's Hospital, and the H&R Block Foundation. Now in 2011, Henry and his late, late wife, Marion, established the Henry and Marion Block Family Foundation to continue their philanthropic legacy. The foundation builds on their vision and values to improve the quality of life in greater Kansas City through thoughtful, innovative, and responsible philanthropy. Ladies and gentlemen, you're in for a treat. Now help me give a warm welcome to Henry and Tom Block.
Leo, thank you for that beautiful introduction. Do you think we can live up to it, Dad? I doubt it. <laughs> we'll tr we can try. We'll do our best, but that was beautiful. And welcome to all of you, and thank you so much for being <clears throat> here. I know Hillary and, and, and Donald are going to be on tonight, and that's, it's quite an honor for you to take some time to, to be with the two of us. I hope, I, I, and I got to say, I got I to gotta agree with Leo. But I'm a bit biased. I think you're in for a treat because this guy's entrepreneurial journey is pretty darn remarkable. And I just hope by the time this 45-minute session is over, you'll get a bit of a flavor for that. And we're going to have to move quickly because we want to allow time for questions, Dad. But I want to start at the beginning. You and your two brothers were born here in Kansas City went to public school, went to Southwest High School. I want to stop there for a second and just ask you this question. Sure. Were you like this straight A brilliant student? <laughs> no, I was a, well, I really am embarrassed to say it with all these students here, but I, I was not a very good student. Why, to explain I, that. I, I, I had to work hard. I had to work hard just to make grades. And I, to be honest with you, I felt that helped me. Well, how could because that help you? My older brother was a good student, and he took a lot of time off and so on. But um, I, I had to work and so to make grades. So you worked hard to make C's? To make C's. And your freshman year, now, he, the guy was born back in 1922. So do you know how old he is? Anybody majoring in math by chance? <laughs> 1922, he would be what? 94, so um, pretty remarkable that you're still here. Jeez. Uh, where did you go to school your freshman year? My first year? Your first year. Bryant School? No, for, for uh, college. Oh, for college. I went to, oh, I went to the, the, the school that was before UMKC. It was Kansas City Univers University. And they had not merged with the University of Missouri. Columbia. Right. So it was this school that he spent his it freshman was this year. School. Yeah, in 1939, I went there after I graduated from Southwest High yeah, School. Most of you I were was too young, I felt, to leave home. Do you see anybody here that may have been in your class? <laughs> and I, I really liked living at home, and I said I went there. And um, then my an, an aunt I had. Uh, a wealthy aunt in New York said, if you would uh, go to Michigan, I'll pay your way. And why, and why Michigan? Her, her brothers, she had s several brothers who, they all went to Michigan, which incidentally has a great football team this year. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> so she said she'd pay your tuition if you went there. So you transferred to Michigan. So that my second year, I transferred to Michigan. Gotcha. And then, and then in your junior year, he was a he was a big time bridge player in college. Loved playing bridge. And in his junior year, you were in a, a bridge tournament, and something happened. No. Can you share with these folks what happened that it day was, that sort it of was, it was altered a, your a life? Sunday, and I was playing in a bridge tournament, and all of a sudden somebody came in and said, "Oh my gosh, we we have to, President Roosevelt has declared war." Uh, it, it was the, uh, they attacked Pearl Harbor, and uh, that ended our bridge game real fast, um, and it changed everybody's life quite a bit. And as you said, I was... Uh, what a, you were a junior at the time. A, a junior, I guess. At the so time. he wanted to enlist, which was the thing to do at the time, right? I, this was a very patriotic war, and you saw, you saw an ad... Uh, about an, an ad that said if you oh, yes. if you stay in school, <clears throat> maybe finish there that There was story. an ad in a magazine that said if you're going to college and you want to enlist in, in the Air Force and you enlist in the Air Force, uh, we'll let you stay in college until you graduate. And I thought that's wonderful because I did not want to go in the infantry. I didn't want to, I could only remember what happened in World War I uh, where people lived in trenches and dirt and so on, and 
I said, I, I just don't want to be in the infantry. And uh, this was, if, so I enlisted in the Air Force. And what happened? And, and, but they went back on their word. They said they, <laughs> they'd let me stay in school till I graduate. They didn't. In my, uh, the beginning of my senior year, very beginning of it, um, they called me to active duty. And, uh, and so, so that, you went through training, you were sent over to Europe. Yeah, I went to San Antonio, SAC, they called it. And you were actually selected based on physical and mental tests to become a pilot. Right. Right? Right. And, and uh, you were pretty uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. pleased well, with yourself, weren't you, to be picked as a pilot? Well. And you called your mother to tell her the good news? Yeah. And my mother, I don't think, had a lot of confidence in me. <laughs> she said, if you're going to be a pilot, your dad who was your, a lawyer, uh, will go to Washington and get you out of the Army, you know, <laughs> as if he could. And uh, so, so I said, okay, Mom. Uh, I always listened to her. And uh, uh, So you took a different position in the plane. So I became a navigator. Right. And you, so you were, you were over in Europe, stationed in England, and you flew 32 missions. 32 missions. What were the odds of in surviving? The what were the odds of surviving 30 well, missions? So, Do you remember? So, it, it, they were so, all I know. All I know is uh, 72 percent of them died, uh, but, but it was they didn't fly that many missions until later, you know. Right. Or, when I went over it with 25 missions. And our losses were so bad, it went up to 30. Then it went up to 35. And, um, but over a 70% chance of being killed. Over 70% died. And what was the name of the plane that you flew? Heaven Can Wait. Heaven Can Wait, yeah. <laughs> and it still is. That is not original, by the way. Okay. There, there were a lot of Heaven Can And Wait. by the way, just as a plug here, a book is currently being written, I think it's going to be uh, published by the University of Missouri Press, about his World War II experiences, and it's going to be, and it's being written, by the way, by two UMKC professors from the history department. And it's really going to be, I, again, I'm biased, it's a pretty exciting story to, be, to, be, to come out later. But anyway, when you were finished with your tour of duty, sent back to the United States. Right. The Air Force wasn't done with you. And right. they sent right. you to a very, very select uh, program at Harvard. At Harvard. I, I always say I was probably the dumbest person that ever went to Harvard. <laughs> but, what was this program about? Do you remember? Uh, statistical control, and I never knew what that meant until just lately <laughs> for the book. I mean. Yeah. So you were sent to like a three-month, very, very intensive program at Harvard because they wanted to improve the efficiency. It, it, it was only for officers. Only for officers. Right. And um, went through it, and oftentimes during lunch, as what one would expect, uh, during a lunch break, you go eat lunch. Dad often went to the library at Harvard in order to try to figure out what he was going to do with the rest of his life after the war. And one day, you went to the library and you found something that really lit up a bell or lit up a light in your head. Right. There's a, a professor at Harvard named Sumner Schlichter. And uh, he, he wrote a paper um, that was a speech he had given at the... Um, uh, life insurance life executives? In, um, at the Waldorf Astoria. Waldorf Astoria for, to life insurance companies. And he said that business was divided into three groups. There's big business, small business, and labor. And big business and labor are both very powerful. But the small business, which is really the backbone of the United States, needs financial help. And if the, if the insurance, life insurance companies of the world would get together and make it possible for the, them to get more funding, it would be wonderful for the country. And that really turned me on. I, we, my two brothers and I, 
wanted to go into business together. My, my mother wanted us to, and we did too. And um, so that seemed like a good opportunity, and we corresponded. My older brother was in Guam. My younger brother was at... Uh, University of Pennsylvania. Yeah. At uh, the Wharton School. Wharton School of Finance. And um, so we, we wrote each other about this idea, and we all three liked it. Help, let's help small businesses. So they emailed each other back and forth. Or, I guess it was not email, was it? <laughs> I don't think so. So they did correspond, and, and, and it's, it's amazing to read some of these letters that they wrote. They were so passionate about this idea of starting their own business. So after the war, Dad took a job that he hated as a, a stockbroker. I'm, I'm going to move this along so we can hopefully get to some questions, which is usually the best part when we do this kind of thing. Right. Um, and he hated, he hated it and really was anxious to, to quit and, and to go into business with his brothers. So he and his older brother, Leon, worked up a business plan, 50 pages, to offer 50 five zero different services to small businesses. They went back to meet with this professor at Harvard to run the idea by them. And do you remember what the professor told yeah, you? He said a lot of people think they know what they what can do, and, but he said, they fail, you'll probably fail too. You'll probably fail. So they took this long train ride back there to be told, you're probably going to fail. Took the train back, but they were not deterred. And so Leon, the older brother, and dad, the middle son, uh, uh, started this business at 31st and Main. They used their, their $50 a month uh, right. stipend from the, from the government as a, the yeah, GI they, Bill of Rights to, to pay the rent. Rights. And they went over to Prospect. And what did you do over at Prospect Avenue? Uh, you, gymnasium. Yeah, no, but when you, you, when you first were starting out, you two guys would take one, each took one side of the street. Oh, yes. It, we, it, we decided to practice our sales technique. And so uh, my older brother, Leon, and I, each took one side of the street to trying to sell these, what were there, 50 services? 50 services. 50 services. And uh, he took one side and I took one side. And uh, people occasionally would ask us, well, give us a reference. And then we had no references. And uh, we, we didn't do very well. In fact, we, we didn't get any customers. Had no customers. So Leon quit. So Leon, Leon had, was a student at MU, Missouri, and uh, in law school to practice law like, like our father. And so he went back to school. But Dad, he I went back to school. I, 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 I apologize. A lawyer. I forgot something. You didn't have any money other than that $50 a month. You didn't have any money. No and, money. and you had this great idea. You had this rich aunt in New York who paid your tuition. Right. And you thought, you and, you and your brother thought, gosh, she could help you out, right? Right. And so oh, you, yes. so I, I think you need to tell them about yeah. that. Yeah. So my brother Leon and I figured out we had these 50 services that we wanted to give little companies, you know, accounting, window decorating, window decorating all secretarial, kind of things, temporary help, temporary help, insurance. You name it. How much experience did you have in any? We had these? none. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I thought if we could just get a big office in New downtown in Kansas City, we could hire a lot of great people. people. And uh, but we'd had no money, so uh, we decided to call on our rich aunt. It, it, she, she lived at the Waldorf Astoria in New York, and. Uh, Leon and I called on her and said, uh, we have this idea, and told her how it came about, and uh, uh, she did us. And what did you ask her for? What did you, what did you ask her? How much? We wanted uh, $50,000. As a, as a gift, right? As a gift, 50000 <laughs> She was very wealthy. She was single, and uh, her, she had a bunch of brothers who were all wealthy, and they were, they were all dying, and... She had plenty of money, and uh, 
she, so we called on her, asked her for 50,000, and she did us a wonderful favor. Favor. She said, no. <laughs> she said, I will loan you 5,000 if your father will co-sign the note. <laughs> and I say she did a wonderful favor because if we would have taken the 50,000, gone downtown, rented a big building or an office, and we'd have gone broke. And uh, just like uh, the professor said, and uh, so. So she did you a favor. She did us a big favor. So and after. We, and, we, and when my brother quit, I sent the 5,000. You sent it back, back to her. Sent it back. That's and, right. And he, he left. Yeah. And so after Leon quit, after, after three months, dad was on his own. He eventually figured out he was never going to be able to successfully market 50 services as a team of one <clears throat> uh, with no experience in any of them. So he eventually narrowed it down to six different services and then finally to one. And that one, by the way, was not tax preparation, but tax preparation, interestingly, was one of the 50 of the original. He began to market one service, and that was bookkeeping bookkeeping to the smallest of small businesses. And as he said, he'd often get close getting a, an account, but they'd say, give me a reference, and he didn't have any. But you finally got your first customer in 1947. And you remember that first customer? Yeah, he was a, had a hamburger stand on Main Street, 39th and Main. And uh, it seemed like our co big competitors um, were the, were the owner's uh, wives. Yeah. They kept the books for the owner. And, uh, Do you uh, remember what you charged for bookkeeping? Yeah, we charged $15 a month. $15 a month. So he now had a reference. So he could go around and pick up other clients. It, it, you know about the, the uh, uh, gal station. Oh, the, yeah. The, That's an interesting story. Yeah. You want to tell that? Uh, somebody had a... Um, a gas yeah, station. I think it's pretty apropos. Um, uh, he he owned a man owned about three gas stations. Th three gas stations, and uh, he said, "Well, uh, I can't. Uh, you know, I just can't afford forty five dollars a month." Uh, and I said, "That's okay. You, you don't need to pay me anything." So you did it for free. I did it for free, and I said, "When when you feel I'm worth it, you can pay me." If and, if and when. Did he ever offer to pay you? He never offered. <laughs> <laughs> so I, but I did ask him, and then he started paying me. He did start paying yeah. you. So believe it or not, this guy developed a pretty good bookkeeping business. I mean, relatively speaking, he was still living at home with his parents because he could not afford to be on his own. He was not married, so he had very minimal expenses. But he was at actually making a a living, so to speak. But it got to the point where he could not both service his existing clients and also sell to <clears throat> prospects. And so he decided he needed, he needed some help. So you put an ad in the paper, as I recall. Right. So tell uh, about I needed that. some help. So I put an ad in the Kansas City Star, and I only got one answer. It was from my mother. <laughs> <laughs> And she said, I know who you should hire, your brother Dick, the Richard. And uh, I said, Mom, I didn't know where. Dick had a good job. He worked for a company called Stern Brothers, a brokerage firm uh, selling bonds or working on bonds. And, and he was married, too. He and was he was married. He was married, and I was single. And. Um, and you said, Mom, I can't afford that. And I said, Mom, I can't afford it, yeah. And she said, well, I'll help you. And I said, Mom, I will never let you help me at all. Yeah. I just wouldn't do that. And, but eventually, Dick decided to quit his job and join me. And uh, I really needed some help. And you two guys were one heck of a team. Yeah. A heck of a team. You, I think you were at our office. 
where you we bet? started up in the up second floor. Second floor at the Westport, Westport in Maine. Westport in Maine. And we, we rented, we went to a lumber yard and bought a, a four by eight. Now wait, you're getting ahead of me now. Oh, I'm sorry. Be careful there. So what happened was these guys built up a decent bookkeeping business, but it wasn't a great business because they had a lot of attrition. They would pick up a new customer, lose a customer, pick up a customer, lose a customer. It wasn't really growing. They did, as part of this $15 a month, they would do tax preparation for their bookkeeping clients as part of the deal, part of the $15 a month. Word got around town in Kansas City that these guys are pretty good at doing tax returns. And believe it or not, people would walk into their office and say, and say to one of the two guys, I heard you do taxes, will you do my tax return? And they began to build a little bit of a business during the tax season of just tax preparation at, they charge $5 for a federal and state. They charge $5, period, for federal and state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. By 1954, they were so busy doing well, tax returns. When the first ad, we were wait, 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 very, very the lucky. Ad. We were extremely lucky. Well, but now wait, before you go there though, before you go there, in 1954, you and Dick made a very important strategic decision, and that was to quit doing income taxes. Remember, you quit. So we're just going to focus. They felt they were neg neglecting their core bookkeeping customers. Yeah. So they said, we're going to. So when people walked in the, their office in 1955 with their shoebox, expecting them to do your tax return, what did you tell them when they walked into the office? Um, you, you had gone yeah. out of that business. Yeah, doing, doing the bookkeeping, you mean. Doing the taxes. Oh. You went out of the tax business. And people said... Oh, yes, that's right. We, we, we went into the bookkeeping business. That's right. And, and said we were not going to do the tax. Now, tell them the story about this guy from the Kansas City okay. Star. Well, there's a fellow named John White, who's a very dear friend, and he, he worked in the... Um, advertising department of the Kansas City Star, and we did his tax return and uh, because he had done it for our bookkeeping service. And he came up one day to have his taxes done like he normally does. And uh, we said, uh, uh, John, uh, we're sorry we've gone out of that business. Uh, we're only doing uh, uh, Taxes for our bookkeeping clients. For, uh, for, our, uh, for our bookkeeping clients, exactly. Thank you. And, um, and so what did he and, do? And he, he, we said, he said, you won't do my tax return? And we said, we can't, John. We're, we're, we're busy with our clients now. We have to do theirs. We weren't making any money, but we were, grow we were had a little uh, living, sort of. And you were working seven days and nights a week. And we, yeah. And um, so John left, and he was di very disappointed. But he came back about three days later. He's really responsible for H and R Block, and he said, "You know, I've got an idea. Instead of advertising bookkeeping for fifteen dollars a month, why don't you start running ads just for income tax?" And I said, "Income tax," and I, I said. How much are the ads? And he said they were they were two columns by about six inches, little little ads. And uh, I I I said um, how much? How much is it? And I, he he said uh, a hundred dollars. One ad would be a hundred dollars. Hundred dollars. And I said, gosh, at at. Uh, how much? At five dollars a return. I, I said we'd have to do twenty returns just to get our money back. And uh, uh, and he said, no, that's not right. He, he said that's not right. And I said, what do you mean it's not right? And he said, well, you have to run at least two ads. <laughs> one, one ad won't prove anything. And with that, I I got to admit we had nothing but good luck. Uh, luck, if you're an entrepreneur, you've got to have good luck. And we have had a lot of good luck. That ad appeared just when W-2s came out. 
if we'd have advertised a week earlier or a week later, we'd have had nobody. But we ran that first ad, and I went around to pick up the books from our clients. And um, on a Monday Dick morning, Dick ran the office, and uh, I got to um, uh, one one of our clients' offices, and he said, "By the way, you're supposed to call your brother." And I called Dick up, and he said, "Get back as quickly as you can. We've got an office full of people." And uh, so that's how it started. But it, the ad appeared at just at the right time, and the people. You know, came there are, in. There are a lot and, of times when he said I we got, were lucky. As the business grew, it bothered me. Uh, it really bothered me because I'd see people, they had to walk up a long flight of stairs. You've been there. It's a long flight of stairs, no elevator at, th at Westport in Maine. And, um, um, and you'd have a room full of people sitting. And had a room full of people. And I, I went to Dick and I said, Dick, let's, I've got a great idea. Let's quit advertising. When we catch up, these people would be sitting there all day long to, for their income tax. For, for what did we charge? Five dollars. Five dollars. And uh, so. Um, and what did Dick it, say? Dick said, never. We'll never quit advertising. And that really made the company. Why do you say that made the company? Why? Beca because we, then we had to develop pro programs. You had to change the way you were operating. And brunings yes. and things like that. To develop systems in develop order to system. accommodate the volume. Yeah. So that was the beginning of H and R Block. It, it was actually the, the name of the company back in nineteen from nineteen forty seven to nineteen fifty five was actually United Business Company, a name that mean, meant nothing. United Business Company. And then they got a letter from a lawyer. I'm just going to make this real quick. In the east, right? Uh, from a, a lawyer in Boston who said, "Stop using that name." I have a client in Boston who has the same name. So Dad and Dick decided to well, let's. They didn't, you didn't like the name anyway, did you? Didn't like the name anyway. So, so they came up with H&R Block. But you know, it's interesting, it's, it's spelled with a K, but the, your last um, name is actually, yeah, mine is an it, H. Why did you change it, it because to Because uh, people would write our checks wrong. <laughs> so I, I, I said, let's start, let's advertise it with a K. Yeah, and you sure, certainly wouldn't want somebody to blotch your tax return. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So after that 1955 tax season, his dad told me one day, he said, we knew we had a winning poker hand and we wanted to play it for all we got. So they decided they wanted to open a new city. And while they were figuring that out, in comes a lawsuit. Remember, you, got a, you were sued. Remember you were sued? Oh yeah, we were sued by lawyers and by accountants. For advertising, they back in those days they could not advertise in the newspaper, or I guess anything. So that was an, an additional incentive to open up in another city, hoping that that, they, that, who, that other city that lawyers and accountants, accountants would leave them alone and not come after them for what they felt and, was unfair. And, and so Dick practice. and I met where to go, and. Uh, uh, he what said, where, where do you want to open? And I said, well, maybe Topeka or St. Joe or somewhere. And uh, he, Dick said, how about New York City? <laughs> and, um, uh, and that's where you went. And so that's where I went and opened um, seven, seven, off offices. seven offices. You were a little baby then. That's right. Um, I, by then I had... Uh, Two, Mar Marion was pregnant. We have, I have four children, two boys and two girls. And, uh, and so I'm going to, I'm going to move this on because I want to, I, I want to allow for questions answered and probably some of these folks have homework too. Yeah. You know, <laughs> oh gosh, aren't you glad you don't have, oh, you, of course you work every night anyway, but anyway, he still goes to his office every day, by the way, at 94. Huh? Yeah, I said, you still go to your office every day. I do. 
And sometimes I'm talking to him on the telephone. He says, I don't have time to talk to you. I'm too, I got too much work to do. I, I like to work. Well, he loves to work. My, my wife died three years ago, and so I have no reason to stay I, I, I want to come back to that, what you work on. I, I think they may be interested in knowing what you do. But anyway, in 1956, the year after that winning poker hand, they went to New York. He and Dick would alternate every two weeks being in New York City to I run it. I seven offices in New York City. And something else that he would, he would say was lucky happened. The IRS, which before that time would do tax returns free for anybody, stopped doing free tax preparation. And so Dad said, we were just lucky. We were in the right place at the right time. And I would argue he's wrong. Very he wasn't. Lucky. He wasn't lucky. He made luck. He made luck. He wasn't just sitting around. He made his luck. So anyway, they both hated New York. They couldn't wait to get home. But they had seven offices there that actually broke even the first year. They put an ad in the New York Times to sell it. They got one response. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm doing this fast. That's fine. And, and they got one response from two accountants who said they only had $10,000, but they'd have to give them New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, a huge uh, geographic we, we area. extra land. Huh? And, and Dad and Dick said, well, gosh, for only $10,000, at least give us a percentage of your future revenue. And today, we refer to an arrangement like that as, anybody know? Franchising. Interesting, the term didn't exist. But H&R Block, Kentucky Fried Chicken, McDonald's, all at virtually the same time were doing this concept of selling geographic areas in return for a percentage of future revenues. You never heard of the word franchise? No. Did you ever hear the word entrepreneur? No, never heard of that I know can remember. So that was the beginning of this expansion. They worked very hard to, to go uh, uh, throughout the country through both company-owned offices and franchised offices, I, use I, their I, own money. I, I would add, yeah. for, the, for those in the audience that are entre potential entrepreneurs, to me, the important thing was giving, making, helping your customer. That was our, that was our whole life, to help the customer. And we didn't raise fees. We kept our $5 fees for many years. 12 years. 12 years. And our, our customers couldn't understand that. They thought, how can they, they don't raise their fees. And they kept telling other friends to come. And our office grew like that. Yeah. You've got some figures on that. You well, can yeah. I mean, the company has done, I think uh, Leo said, 650 million returns, uh, over 10,000 locations yeah. today, uh, almost 100,000 employees. Um, but it was, it was this concept of serving the customer that, that I think is pretty remarkable here. It's really two things. It's, it's serving the customer and it's persevering. For eight years, he and Dick were basically living hand to mouth. So they persevered. I would have quit many times earlier, but they kept at it. And then you kept, you were so devoted to your customers. He was interviewed in 1976 by a newspaper reporter. And he was asked the question, who's number two in your industry? You know what his answer was? I don't know. There, there was no national competitor. They, so these two brothers not only started a company, they started an industry and they dominated it. Now we won't go into what's happened in the last 10, 20 years. It's a different story, but we're not gonna get into that here. But dad uh, became the face of the For company. For information, Tom followed me as CEO. And that's when things started to... <laughs> no, no. Is that what you're getting at? No. Okay. Not, well. not at all. Oh, you, we won't you go... You did it exactly as I would I, I, He was my mentor, so I tried to do what he did. But the problem was his, those shoes were too big to fill. That was the problem. At any rate... You want to be a teacher. I did. You and he wanted to teach school. And when you retired and you have... Not all that long ago, you turned 90 years old, and you decided you needed, you needed a new challenge at 90 years old. And so you met with your lawyer. Do you remember this? 
Yeah, very well. Can, can you tell them about that? You met with your lawyer. Well, I met with my lawyer, and I said, you know, I've got to find something to do now. And, uh, I've always been active in the community, and uh, um, he said, have you ever thought of starting a... Uh, uh, a family foundation? A foundation, charitable foundation. And I said, well, I've heard of them, but I, I know very little about it. So um, he gave me uh, four or five books to read on foundations. Um, and the books all said the same thing. If, if you have more money than you need, uh, you don't want to leave too much to your children. <laughs> 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 because the third generation is bad. The third generation is bad. And uh, that's two from you. You've got two more to that's go. That's true. So, uh, and they all said the same thing. So I thought, well, maybe I'll open a foundation. And so I called a meeting with Tom and the other three children. Uh, I think it was on a Sunday. Yeah. And down the basement. And, uh, um, and you told us. I, I thought they would say, Dad, just give the money to us. We'll, we'll give it to charity. But they all <laughs> said, that's a great idea. So we formed a foundation. And uh, this is part of it right here. And uh, so. And and at, at that time, at that time, I was involved mainly with three organizations: um, UMKC, the Nelson Art Gallery, who's a very important officer here, and uh, and St. Luke's and St. Luke's Hospital, which did a wonderful job when when my wife got quite sick. Um, so so. so uh, we give them. So most all of the we annual can... funding goes to these three organizations, and today the, the Tom's very active in the foundation. The, the foundation is the is the third largest in this region, and someday it's going to be a whole lot bigger. It'll be a lot bigger. And um, and this is what he does. And why why I'm just curious why Kansas City? Why you restrict you restrict the the philanthropic giving to Kansas City? Why, yes. Why yeah. is that? Oh, I, because it's very, uh, very simple, very obvious. I have a big debt to the people of Kansas City. Explain without that. The, without the people of Kansas City, there would have been no H in our block. They made Kansas City. They didn't, it wasn't St. Louis or Denver or anything. It's this strictly, is where... Strictly the people of Kansas City made us what we are. And so we, our foundation only gives money to Kansas City. Right. So uh, how about if we stop uh, right here and see if there's a few questions? Do we have time, yes. Beverly or yes. Ben? A few, okay. Yes. Sir. Stop yeah. So besides saving it up penny by penny. Well, you, do you know Dean, the Dean here? <laughs> Easy. I don't know the answer to that one. That's, that's a great question. How do you get funding for your idea? I mean, you tried to get funding for your idea and you struck out. And so you, you, and as he looks back on it today, it was a blessing that he did not get that funding because he would have failed. In your case, it may not be that way. Uh, you know, there are these, uh, uh, you know, angel investors and people who are looking to, to fund startup. Uh, and uh, I would say talk to Jeff Hornsby and, and, and maybe he can point you in a particular direction. Thank you. Maybe a rich aunt. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Pedro. I'm one of the uh, assistant PhD students in faculty here. Uh, the question I have 
it's for you, Mr. Henry Black. Um, that's the third talk I see from you guys, and I'm, it's always learned something new. But in your history, after you started your company, what was a point that you, you thought, okay, that will not work, uh, I will give up, and what made you overcome this challenge? That, that's a great question. Did you ever get to the point, because you were really unsuccessful for eight years, did you ever get to the point where you said, you know, th this isn't going to work out? Yeah, and I, how did you I, overcome I, I, that? I, I didn't want to get a job. I, I wanted to be in... <laughs> Explain what you mean by that. You didn't want to just get a job. I wanted to be in business for myself. And when he was... I had a, I had a job as a stockbroker for one year to the day. I quit one year from the day, and my parents op opposed my quitting. They said, someday you'll be a partner. And I said, you know, I, I just was on the telephone talking about different stocks. And, and the funny thing is his mother said, yeah, go start your own business with your brothers. And his father said, stay, stay. You're going to fail if you start your own business. So that created a conflict. And I saw there's a, another part to that. I saw a movie. When, I was just going to say the movie. Yeah. I saw a movie when I was a kid that really 13 years me. old. It was the life of Louis Pasteur. Do any of you know who Louis Pasteur is? He invented the pasteurization of milk in France. And uh, th this movie, in fact, you told me, called me one day and said they're going to show that movie in That's Kansas right. City recently. That's right. And it was a wonderful old movie. But it, it showed uh, Louis Pasteur in, a, in a, room, a small room with a nurse and a woman lying there dead. And... Um, uh, uh, so how did that? And, and, he, and she, he said, she's dead. We may as well leave. And the woman took the, the utensils and threw them in a something. And, and uh, he said, aren't you going to clean them? And she said, no, he's dead. But, you know, and he was trying to saying that, you know, that might hurt somebody else if you don't clean them. And I, and I said, that really affected me. It affected and I said, you. I want to do something to help people. I want to help people. You say, yeah, you said, and he was interviewed by Walter Cronkite, which some of you may not know. And, and you know, he asked basically the same question. And Dad answered me, he said, I just didn't want to get a job and live and die. I wanted to, I wanted to, to make a difference. I mean, it yeah, sounds like a cliche, a but he, he well, really... I know my father had told me when he was young, he, he went to Loose Park, and he wrote down what he was good at and what he was bad at. He was trying to figure out what he should do. And uh, he decided to go into law. And, but uh, law didn't uh, interest me. So... But it did my older brother. Yes, ma'am. We've got another one over okay, here. Okay, okay, okay. Hey, thank you for coming. I'm sure you're an inspiration to everybody here in the room. But my simple question is, what is your plan for your foundation in the future? Huh, good question. What's your plan for the foundation in the future? Your plan for the foundation. <laughs> well, you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> he has actually been very specific about this. Yeah, there, there's a big debate going on uh, in, 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 this, in this area about whether a foundation should go on forever or should sunset. Well, I'll tell you, the way, the way uh, UMKC is being run by our wonderful chancellor, they're... We are so lucky in this city so and in this lucky. university. And we've got a lady here from the, the Nelson who's number two there. And, uh, the, and they are doing a wonderful job, too. Yeah. So dad has made the, the he, he never likes to make things easy for anybody. So he wants this foundation to go on in perpetuity forever. And, you know, I, he says he's not going to live forever. I'm not so sure about that. <laughs> But he has, he has done videos. 
he has put things in writing in great detail. He learned from Ewing Kaufman, who unfortunately didn't do a lot of this, but he learned from Mr. Kaufman. And so dad has been very, very specific, but still it's so darn tricky because who could project what's gonna happen 200 years from now? What's gonna happen to art galleries? Or will it be online? Or will, how will universities operate? And so it's difficult to know and to follow the donor's intent is going to be it's going to be hard, especially in a hundred years. Nobody will at the foundation will know him, will have known him. So, but that's his intent. He wants this foundation to go on forever. And the hard and fast rule, while there is flexibility in bylaws and all that, is that it can never go outside of Kansas City. So, this city better stay here. <laughs> Should I tell him a joke about it? Yeah. All right. Ben, I think we've, we've got. Over here. You've got one more over there, and then one we'll do more. one last one over here. Okay. Sir. Hello, sir. My name is Ryan Rambo, and uh, I'm part of the eScholars pro program. Wonderful. It's, it's changed my life, really, so thank you very much. So I have a question about pricing, especially in the services uh, business. It's kind of hard to, to price this thing. Did you ever play with the $15 a month? Did you ever bump it up to $20 and find that it was wrong and, and drop it back down? Were you ever tempted to, to push it up higher? You don't want to go there. We're going to be here until about 8.15. <laughs> the question is about pricing. Pricing? Pri the price of your service. Yeah. He, he is, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but he is like so sold on this concept that low prices are so powerful, okay? He would tell you that H&R Block is too, price too high today. Well, He's, all I know is, well, we didn't raise prices for a minute, long time. Our number of customers, which is so important, just went up and up and up. And, um, and, and then they only raised prices with inflation. Never more than inflation. Never more than the rate, rate of was, inflation. So the first words, 12 the first, year was we constant. We have a 3% inflation. The, we might raise prices 2%. And, and it did something which he didn't realize until years later is that it created a, an obstacle to competition. People looked at this, they were so efficiently run that it was very difficult for a, a shop, an individual to open up a, a tax office and be profitable and be competitive price wise. So they were really not only grabbing market share but they were creating an obstacle uh, for competition. Before we end, can, can he just tell a story, one yeah. little story about what is an entrepreneur? Because I suspect there are oh, several of these oh, folks yeah. who be an entrepreneur. Okay. Just what, what is an entrepreneur? Um, very simple. Um, there, there was a, um, a, 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 a building a strip a, shopping a strip, center. A strip shopping center. It had three tenants in it. One at each end and one in the middle. And um, the, uh, the, the one, at one end put a, put a sign up. And they all sold the same merchandise, right? Oh, and they all sold the identical merchandise. The one at one end put up a, a sign that said, going out of business sale. The one at the other end put up a sign that said year-end sale. The entrepreneur was in the middle. What did he do? What did he, what did he do? He, he said... He put up a sign. He, he put up a sign that, that said... Um, <laughs> main. Main entrance. <laughs> With that, we thank you all so much for being here and great.
Thank you very much. I, I know I speak for everyone when I say thank you for being here today and thank you for all you and your family has done for Kansas City. Um, thanks again. Um, we have some pizza and refreshments. Please uh, head outside to the Hall of Fame and we will see you again uh, next month. Thank you. Oh, Howard. Thank you.